All right, good morning. Well, we're uh, in Genesis, and uh, we started out last week in uh, just the preference to this phenomenal book uh, that leads the way to the rest of the writings that are inspired by God. But it is probably the book that's the most attacked. And so we dealt with last week, not specifics in Genesis, but the, the premise of Genesis. And since we're so bombarded with um, things, whether it's a sitcom or a late night talk show host or CNN or whatever it is, that in, in one way or another belittles belief and belittles um, the concept of the creation being a divine, that uh, last week we looked at the scientists, literally the, the, those creators of the very laws of physics that we uh, compute everything around based upon those laws, political leaders, um, scientific leaders that have made direct statements that we quoted, uh, dozens of them, if you recall, uh, concerning their belief in the Bible, the Word of God, and in, uh, looking even to probably one of the most premier scientists of the world, uh, Einstein, when it comes to the reality of God because of the very laws of, uh, what we call the laws of nature, or the, the laws of physics. And so doing that is a parameter that there's... Um, uh, not only an inspiration that's by faith that we read it and understand it, but to know that it isn't exclusive from science. Science means knowledge. And there is a relationship between, uh, in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth, and what we know about it, science. That the concept of uh, singularity or the Big Bang does not match up with any other concepts, laws of physics that we do understand that are absolute. And so what you have in competition, if you will, with Genesis is the theory of evolution which contradicts everything that we base our world on as far as science when it comes to the laws of physics. The, um, this morning we're going to look at, at three major items. Um, God making uh, man in his image and that it's for a reason, it's for a purpose. And that God did not create the earth as it is. It became this way. And I'm not talking about global warming and stuff like that. <laughs> I'm talking about the moment of, of, uh, that we see in Genesis chapter 1. And then evolution is a theory. It is not a law. It is a theory. The, um, there are laws like Murphy's Law. If anything can go wrong, it will go wrong. <laughs> and we you know, that's really a theory. It shouldn't be called a law. Um, but for pessimists, it seems to run their life. And yet, it, sometimes it affects us in a, in a random way. Um, and a uh, trying to dismantle a um, thing in a bathroom cabinet and, you know, change the uh, thing so I could take take it out because of the water damage we talked about the other day and so we're going to have to take this thing out and replace it and all that stuff. Anyway, the um, uh, <laughs> I put a, a hat on that uh, they had bought me the other, you know, some months ago actually, but it's got lights on the bottom of the brim, one of those funky things. You think, oh, that might work. And so I put, I thought, oh, maybe this will work. So I turn the light on, put it on, and they get into there and look up and I'm trying to see the screws that I'm unscrewing, but that doesn't work with trifocals. Because you, you do, you try to get the light and the trifocal to see this. So when I could see the screw, I couldn't find it. But when I could, <laughs> like that, like, and I'm going, oh, this isn't working. <laughs> but then this morning, uh, with all the, the digging up of the floors and they had to chisel the, 
the tile and that put a bunch of dust in the air and it just goes everywhere, you know, just kind of unavoidable. So we're dusting everything and cleaning it up. Well, this morning I get all ready to go and, and uh, I sit down with a little uh, uh, office kind of chair by my desk and, and it's a uh, light uh, color, very light, light, uh, just between cream and tan, you know. And so I sat on it and I finished up my notes and I get up to leave and she goes, wait, <laughs> my whole backside is dust. You know, so um, anyway, you know, Murphy's quote law or theory is that if it can go wrong, it will. Of course, that's, that's not a real uh, structural <laughs> physics law. Um, but sometimes we look at uh, the theory of evolution in the same way, and it just comes out like, oh, yeah, well, obviously it's right. All these um, people say it. It's not really all those people when you look at what we uh, shared last week when uh, it comes to the real science and the nature of it, but it's what's being sold for, for by those, really, people that are anti-Christ. Um, I want to start off with this. It's a, a quote from Dr. Jason Lisley's book called The Ultimate Proof of Creation, and it's a quote from page 57. Uh, he says, if evolution were true, and so what, what, why I'm quoting this is because he's dealing with the generalities of the principles rather than us dealing with all the specifics of some of the things that would just, you know, go on and on. We could do years doing that. But just what's the foundation of this idea? If evolution were true, the concept of science would not make sense. Science actually requires a biblical creation framework in order to be possible. In other words, the framework that's in Genesis of how things unfold has a creator, has a, has a purpose, has order to it. Uh, without that, science actually requires a biblical creation framework in order to be possible. Therefore, evolution uh, turns out to be more of anti-science than a science. And he says, here's why. In order to do science, we take for granted that the universe uh, is understandable, that it can be quantified in a way that the mind can comprehend. We assume that the universe is logical and orderly and that it obeys mathematical laws that are consistent over time and space, even though conditions in different regions of space and areas of time are quite diverse, there's nonetheless an underline, underlining uniformity because there's such regularity in the universe, there are many instances where scientists are able to make successful predictions about the future. For example, astronomers can successfully compute the positions of the planets, the moons, asteroids far into the future. Without uniformity in nature, such predictions would be impossible and science could not exist. The problem for evolution is that such regularity only makes sense in a biblical creation worldview. That's what we talked about last week. The, what is your worldview? And the worldview that God, in the beginning, God, an intelligent being, a creative being, God Almighty, created everything with order. Everything else makes sense. If it all happened from an explosion, then none of the physics, none of the laws of nature could be applied because it would be chaos. And the order does not come out of chaos. And so they don't match up. He points out that the biblical creationist expects there to be order in the universe. And this is why the great scientists like Newton and others would look for the answers because they knew they had to be there. Not like, I'm going to make up an equation, but there must be an equation there because it's in order. So there must be an orderly equation that we can count on that's predictable, that's repeatable. We see it all the time when the sun, uh, the, when, as the orbit of the earth and everything, and the sun that we call the sunrise, the sunset, and so on, and the earth and the moon and all the other stars, and what order is there that there's a, there's a consistency to it. 
God made all things, Genesis 1.1 and 1.3, and has imposed things by his power, Hebrews 1.3. The creationist expects that the universe would function in a logical, orderly, law-like fashion. Furthermore, God is consistent, 1 Samuel 15.29 and Numbers 23.19, and omnipresent, Psalms 139.7-8. Thus, the creationist expects that all regions of the universe will obey the same laws, even in regions where the physical conditions are quite different. And I pointed out, uh, I think it's Psalms uh, 42 or whatever it was, that uh, it says in space you're going to find water. Now they're finding, oh, I can't believe it. The Bible already said it's going to be there. So there's consistency, there's predictability in all of that. Um, Thus the creation expects that all regions of the universe will obey the same laws, even in regions where the physical conditions are quite different. The entire field of astronomy depends upon this important biblical principle. Now, just give some examples of of, um, the practicality in formulas. This is a formula where the natural laws are mentioned. And uh, if we can put the first one up. Um, One of the more common specific disciplines that comes to mind in physics is... uh, laws is the physics which includes uh, Newton's law of gravitation. That this law describes the attractive gravitational force that exists between two masses and the law of uh, universal gravitation expressed in these mathematical equations. We got it? Okay. Now, I'm sure that makes sense to you. Um, I'm doing this, I'm just going to do three, but just to point out, there's numbers of them, and we, we named the names of the scientists of all these things last week. But the issue is... They're absolute. Another example of a natural law in physics is Ohm's law that describes the relationship between voltage, current, and resistance. We wouldn't be able to use the things that we use that are, that are electrical if it wasn't for this law. And so it's the, uh, the, the uh, current and the, uh, the resistance and um, the voltage. Thank you. And then the natural laws that are found in chemistry also. The most important laws in chemistry, the law of conservation of matter. This law states that matter can neither be created nor destroyed. This establishes that the foundation of understanding chemical reactions, since matter is a reaction, is just combined in the form that it appears. So what you have is Whatever matter exists, when it's combined with other matter, it doesn't lose anything. It simply recombines itself in a different way so that the number of atoms always rem- remain the same, whether it's a mixture or a compound or whatever's happening. You're going to end up with the same number of atoms, just in different order, which creates different chemicals, uh, uh, different specific things. The, um, of course, you've got E equals MC squared and all these various other ones, but... What would seem to me, these issues are complex. They've made them simplistic in the sense of being able to look at it, but it's extremely complex. But to a mathematician, which I'm not, they're like two plus two. It's like, oh, we've discovered two plus two is four. It always adds up that way. This always works. It's a law. It is a law that can be counted on. It is um, uh, what we base our sciences on the interaction between other laws in the universe that we know will take place. Evolution violates all of those things. But then they depend upon them for the proof of their very sciences of other things. You can't have it both ways. Moreover, he says, going back to his quote, uh, God is beyond time, 2 Peter 3.8, and has chosen to uphold the universe in a consistent fashion. In other words, the creation of matter and everything else, he created it, so once it's done, it cannot be destroyed, it can only be redistributed. Uh, It has laws of how it works, how electricity works, all of these other things. That um, it works in a consistent fashion, he says, throughout time for our benefit. So even, and which is what's called the uh, privileged planet, uh, that the scientists, have, the astronomers have finally agreed 
w- exists. In other words, we are in a very specific place in the universe that is so precise, one degree, one way or the other, we would either freeze or boil. We would either not be able to see the rest of the universe because of the cloudy effect of the Milky Way, or uh, we would be too close uh, gravitationally to other things and we wouldn't exist in the way that we do in the atmosphere that we have. It is precisely where it needs to be for us to exist. In other words, it privileges us. It allows us to exist, not evolve for it, but it's a home. It was created for us. So even though the, the conditions in the past may be quite different than those, he says, in the present or the, uh, in the future, the way God upholds the universe, what we call the laws of nature, will uh, not attributably change. In other words, the laws of the universe change no matter what surrounding things happen. I don't care if you have an atomic explosion or whatever else it happens, these laws stay the same. God has told us that there are certain things that we can count on, he says, um, to be true in the future. The seasons, the, um, uh, the cycles, and so on. In Genesis 8.22, Jeremiah 33.20-21, 20 Therefore, under a given set of conditions, the consistent Christian has the right to expect a given outcome because he or she relies upon the Lord to uphold the universe in a consistent way. He's predicted it. He says it's going to happen. We can count on it. And uh, our faith is justified then. These Christian principles are absolutely essential to science. The understanding that it's there, it works here, it'll work in space. So guess what? We fly out in a rocket and it does exactly what we predict it would do based upon the science that we have on Earth. And when we get to the moon, the predictability of how much gravity would be there and so on and why they would need spacesuits and all those things are predictable. And that when we land, there's a way to come back. <laughs> all of those things, predictable. The, these Christian principles are absolutely essential to science. When we perform a controlled experiment using the present starting conditions, we expect to get the same results every time. The future reflects the past in this sense, and scientists are able to make predictions uh, only because there is uniformity as a result of God's sovereign and consistent power. Scientific experimentation would be pointless without uniformity. We would get a different result every time we performed an identical experiment, destroying the very possibility of scientific knowledge. So just a general statement about the principles of the laws of the universe <coughs> that are established that we've discovered that gives us an understanding of what, what happened in the past, what happens now, and what's predictable in the future. All science is based upon that, except the theory of evolution. It does not apply. It does not work. The, um, so going then to um, uh, Genesis 1. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. Just the way that it's worded, that it's separate. He crea- and then what he'll do is he'll explain, he'll say a statement, and then in the next chapter, he'll explain it more in depth, and the next chapter, explain it even more in depth. And the focus in the explanation, Genesis chapter 1, chapter 2, and chapter 3, keeps focusing more and more on the creation of man. So that, that the whole purpose of it is here's a big picture, and now here's how it happens. But in the rest, <coughs> excuse me, in the rest of the Bible, there continues to be explanations of Genesis. For instance, God is without time. He's outside of time. That explains that to him a day is a thousand years and a thousand years is a day. Uh, that he's omnipresent. And all of these other things that apply to his ability to be able to create as well as how it functions. Okay. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. There's a difference between the earth, this beautiful blue-green planet in the middle of space, and now that we can go out there and look back on it, it's even more majestic than we ever thought and so unique. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. Then it says, the earth was without form and void, and darkness was on the face of the deep, 
and the Spirit of God was hovering over the face of the waters. Between Genesis 1-1 and 1-2 is more history. Just like going from Genesis 1 and reading Genesis 2, we, we, it goes into more depth of how it happened, and even the six days uh, and the, for the creation of man, and then the seventh day he rested, and all of these other things, there's, there's greater definition and explanation. So too with this very beginning part. In the beginning, God created the heaven and the earth, because it says the earth was without form and void, and yet the scriptures indicate that it wasn't created that way. In um, Jeremiah chapter 4, verse 23, Jeremiah 4, 23, all the Bible says that, that um, scripture is of no private interpretation, but it, it, it interprets itself, in other words. So each scripture interprets or explains other scriptures. And so when you see Jesus on the cross, what's he doing there? You have Isaiah 53 and Psalms 22 and so on. And then you've got Revelation and the Lamb that's before the throne of God who's able to open the scroll. So it all keeps unfolding and unfolding. Well, in Jeremiah 4.23, it says, I beheld the earth, and indeed it was without form and void. And the heavens, they had no light, which matches Genesis, right? And I beheld, and indeed there was no man. This tells us there was not a pre Adamic race. That what you have is from Adam and Eve, and that's called man. He calls them man. From mankind, therefore, on is where our gene pool comes from and everything else. But there was no man before that. But in Isaiah 45, 18, it says, For thus says the Lord, Isaiah 45, 18, who created the heavens, who is God, who formed the earth and made it, who established it, who did not create it in vain, who formed it to be inhabited. There's two different Hebrew words when it comes to, to what this is all about, is created being bara, and uh, for, form and void is bohu, which means ruin. In other words, he didn't, he, when he created it, he created it in order with a principal way that it was to be, but it became void. He did not, it says in Isaiah 45, 18, create it in vain or void, who formed it to be inhabited. Follow? So between Genesis 1, 1 and 1, 2, it says, God created the heavens and the earth, and the earth was without form and void. Well, Isaiah says it wasn't created that way. So there's something happening between one and two, which he's not basically dealing with right now. It's kind of like saying, here's my family, and you know, here's everybody, and then going on, and then later on saying, oh, ah, by the way, and in my family, this one's adopted, this one, you know, and oh, and, and you get a greater understanding. The creation of God, uh, that God had in Genesis, he created the heaven and the earth, but it says, and it was without form and void. In other words, it had become without form and void based upon Isaiah, which is a, actually a better translation of that anyway. But in Isaiah uh, 45, 18, it wasn't created that way. So what happened? In Isaiah 14, and um, also in Revelation 12, starting with Revelation 12, verses three through four, this is another a sign appeared to me in heaven, fiery dragon, uh, and his tail drew a third of the stars of heaven and threw them to the earth. So the, the devil we know in Job has audience with God, and he's allowed to come before God and speak to him, and you know the challenge with Job and all of those things happen. And so therefore, angelic beings still seem to, fallen angels seem to still have that kind of audience but there's coming a time when he's brought down. A third of them are brought down. Is that the only time that happened? Well, there's just like there are prophecies of other antichrists, and then there's the antichrist. Well, the same thing with this. In Isaiah 14, 12, it says, How are you fallen from heaven? Isaiah 14, 12. How are you fallen from heaven, O Lucifer? Which means day star, because he was... That's, he was filled with wisdom and everything else. The son of the morning. 
How are you cut down to the ground? Now in Ezekiel 28, it explains this. So it asks the question, how are you fallen? How are you cut down? We know later on all, all the angel and, and the, the devil and a third of the angels, all of them are kicked out. So what happened? In Ezekiel 28, go with me to Ezekiel 28. And if you're new to the Bible, this is really no different than saying, okay, here's, here's the story of Jesus Christ in Matthew. And then you go to Mark and you find it filled in a little bit differently. Same story, but more evidence. And then Luke and more history and place and location and geography and statements. And then you get to John and you find all the things that he said in all these places that he was at. Not just what he did, but what he said. And so there, there's this constant fulfilling of, of the issues and the things that are taking place. And then Paul explaining those things based upon the Old Testament and the New Testament. So all 66 books, 40 authors, they come together with one story. So in Ezekiel chapter 28, it says, The word of the Lord came to me again, saying, Son of man, say to the prince of Tyre, thus says the Lord God, to the prince of Kind of hold that in your mind. The prince of Tyre. And there was a prince of Tyre. The ruling authority of Tyre. This, this um, region of great uh, world power at the time. Because your heart is lifted up and you say, I am a God and I sit in the seat of God. So this is a type of antichrist. He was a foretype of that. I am a God. I sit in the seat of gods. In the midst of the seas, you are uh, a man and not a God. Though you set your heart as the heart of a god, behold, you are, you are wiser than Daniel. There is no secret that can be hidden from you. And now it seems to be much more expanded about what's happening with this individual. Uh, with your wisdom and with your understanding, have you gained riches for yourself and gathered gold and silver and, uh, into your treasures, treasuries? But your great wisdom in trade, you have increased your, uh, by your great wisdom in trade, you've increased your riches, and your heart is lifted up because of your riches. Therefore, thus says the Lord God, because you have set your heart as the heart of a God, behold, therefore, I will bring strangers against you. The heart of a God in Elohim, literally is what it is. In other words, there's the King of kings and the Lord of lords. There's God Almighty. There's Yahweh who is above all other gods. And that's a whole other study in itself. But the, the relationship of God Almighty being the creator of everything. And he says, you set yourself up to be a God. He says, behold, therefore, I will bring strangers against you and the most terrible of the nations. And they shall draw their swords against the beauty of your wisdom and defile your splendor. And they shall throw you down into the pit. Which is basically what happened to the Prince of Tyre when it was overthrown and destroyed. And you shall die the death of the slain in the midst of the seas, which is basically what happened in the flooding and uh, of that, just that specific area. And you will stay, and you will say rather before him who slays you, I am a God. Then you're going to say I'm a God. Come on. But you shall be a man and not a God. And in the hand of him who slays you, you shall die the death of the uncircumcised by the hand of the aliens, for I have spoken says the Lord. So this is a typology of the Antichrist who is a uh, devil filled, like Judas says he was filled with the devil to do what he did. And, and so the Antichrist has the spirit of the devil in him to do these things. So it's a manifestation of who the devil is, a physical manifestation. But verse 11, he says, but moreover, to explain it more fully, in other words, of what this is all about in prophecy, the word of the Lord came to me saying, Son of man, take up lamentations for the, not the prince, but the king of Tyre, the ruling authority over the Antichrist, the king of this prince. Okay? And say to him, thus says the Lord, you were the seal of perfection, full of wisdom and perfect in beauty. You were in Eden, the garden of God. Well, you know that you can't go back and say, oh, well, no, the king and the prince is the same thing. No, this is talking about the spiritual being who is the king, the ruler, the principality and powers. It talks about in Ephesians, the ruler over the prince of Tyre, the ruler over that kingdom. And he says, you 
were in the Garden of Eden. You were in Eden, the very Garden of God. So it takes you back to that. Well, there's only Adam, Eve, the Lord, and the snake, right? The devil. He says, now every precious stone was your covering. Well, now this is describing something that doesn't seem to appear to what happened when Adam and Eve was there, right? It says, the sardis and the topaz and the diamond, the beryl, the onyx, the jasper, the, the sapphire, the turquoise, the emerald and the gold, the workmanship of your timbrels and pipes were prepared for you on the day you were created. Most think that this means that his whole body was like we, when we sing. <laughs> Some of you can do. When you sing, uh, that uh, there's an ability to make notes and sounds that are beautiful. His whole body was orchestrated that way so that there was just this, this orchestra, if you will, of sounds that he could make that were beautiful. And um, he, was, he was created as a worship being to bring worship and praise to God. You were the anointed cherub who covers. I established you. You were on the holy mountain of God. You walked back and forth in the midst of fiery stones. You were perfect in your ways from the day you were created till iniquity was found in you. And the iniquity was, we, we know from uh, um, Isaiah, he says, I will rise up, I will be like the Most High God and in other places. He says, but uh, by the abundance of your trading, you became filled with violence within and you sinned. Therefore, I cast you as a profane thing out of the, mountains of God, out of the mountain of God and I destroyed you, O covering cherub, from the midst of the fiery stones. Now, uh, there are people that read the Bible and, and read these portions and don't apply it to Genesis 1, 1, and 1, 2. But to me, it fits the hand in glove. Because here God, says, I didn't, he didn't create it without form and void. That's not the way he created the earth. But in the beginning, God created the earth, and it was beautiful. It was, it was perfect. But what happens when the devil is thrown down, that's when it became without form and void. That's when darkness, and that's what the devil is, a symbol of that darkness. When the darkness fell upon the earth and there was judgment, whether it lasted a minute or ages, it doesn't matter. And so it's not somebody, oh, you're just saying that evolution is true because the time frame has got nothing to do with that. It's a spiritual matter, and it became without form and void. And then God said, let there be light. He says, your heart was lifted up because of your beauty. You corrupted your wisdom for the sake of your splendor. I cast you to the ground. I laid you before kings that they might gaze at you. And the kings I would take to be those other spiritual beings that... Uh, uh, Genesis and other places talk about as far as the, in the principality and the powers and the mights and the rulers of darkness. And they're still there. They still are the things that we battle with spiritually and won't be completely destroyed until after the millennium, the end of the millennium. You defiled your sanctuaries by the multitude of your iniquities. By the iniquity of your trading, therefore I brought fire from your midst, I, it devoured you, and I turned you to ashes upon the earth, which is prophetic of what's going to happen now. In the sight of all who saw you, all who knew you among the peoples are astonished at you. You have become a horror. You shall be no more forever. And that will be after the millennium. So it appears that what has happened is, in the beginning, God created the heaven and the earth. Totally two separate issues. First of all, creating the heaven and then putting the earth right in there. And then the earth literally had become without form and void. And that's when the devil was cast out. And if you imagine he's, uh, just for a minute, he's, he's in the presence of God Almighty. He's, he's on the earth. There are other gods, demons that are there. They're, they're, but there are gods at that time in that sense. And it's a... Uh, um, spiritual beings, in other words. And they're, he's bringing worship back up to the Lord from the sanctuaries, and, and, uh, and he's filled with wisdom and beauty and all of this. It's a whole different realm and a thought of how all creation takes place. 
and then the, the earth is already created, and then the devil says, I'm going to raise up above the Most High with God. In fact, I'm going to be God. Who is he, you know? And God says, what? No. And he casts them down, and the earth becomes without form and void. So he's down. Now all of a sudden, everything he walked in, the beauty, the emeralds and the diamonds and everything else is just normal walkways of gold if the, in that sense, is darkness and corrupt and shifted and, and just distorted. And he's waiting and waiting and waiting. What, what's going to happen? What's going on? And absolute darkness. And then God says, let there be light. And all of a sudden, bam, everything's lit up. What's going to happen now? And God starts this creation from seeds to life, from life to seeds. And he's going, well, what's all this about? And then he takes this place of paradise, this absolute beautiful place that he creates, and he's there in the cool of the garden. God Almighty is there. And he creates out of the dirt that Satan is walking on a being that's not spiritual. He's physical. And he says, I'm giving you rule and authority over this place. That's what the devil had, was rule and authority over it. He said, I'm giving it to you. Everything here belongs to you. It doesn't belong to him anymore. It belongs to you. And so the devil says, Really? How would you like the knowledge of evil? You don't know what you're missing. You need the balance between good and evil. You need to know the, the dark side. And he deceives and pulls down to get back what was his. And he becomes the prince and the power of the air. How do we get it back? He that sins shall die. And so Adam and Eve had the pronouncement of sin upon their life, of death upon their life, but God through Christ has redeemed us and given us the very place that was with Lucifer had as shining lights before the very throne of God to bring praise and worship and fellowship and adoration towards him and be a part of a kingdom out there beyond anything we can even imagine that is our inheritance. Belong to him and we've got it and we're co-heirs with Christ now. So, the beginning part of this. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. The earth became literally with, without form and void. Darkness was on the face of the deep, and the Spirit of God was hovering over the face of the waters. Then God said, Yahir, wah, Yahir. Light be, and light was. And it just, in an instant. And uh, God saw the light, that it was good. But interesting. Here's the light this phenomenal I don't want to do it, essence isn't the word, but an emanation from who God is, because God is light. But it says, and he, God divided the light from the darkness. He divided it. The Bible is very precise. So when a scientist like Newton or others would look at it and say, God divided it, God divided it. God divided it, I wonder. Take a prism up and you look at it and you go, oh my goodness, it's divided. And it's divided from darkness, but it's divided it in and of itself. Our eyes um, are the smallest organs in our bodies yet they have a hundred million tiny cells. You can put the sunlight thing up there. Um, in a in uh, hundred million tiny cells, they're called rods and cones, and inside the retina uh, alone, they are responsible for responding to one thing, mainly, light. The rods help us with vision in low light, and the cones help us see the world in color. In fact, our eyes can uh, visualize all the colors of the rainbow, rainbow when it's reflected wavelengths 
on the light spectrum because of the water. It's like a prism, like holding a prism up. We can see how the light is fractioned. Um, but what can't we see? There is an invisible light. Um, our eyes are actually sensitive to a very narrow wave, as you know, and uh, the light spectrum. To understand how visible light is uh, divided into various light waves, there's a point to all of this. Uh, Isaac Newton shined a light through a prism, and um, the prism then separates the, the light or shows the division between it, uh, and each color appears either red or orange or yellow or green or blue and violet. It's characteristic of uh, the distinct wavelengths. Well, the interesting thing about that is when those colors are put together, all it takes is three of them. In fact, there was a car that was made years ago. It was a test car. And uh, because of this science, uh, they, he had a light bulb on one side of the car and on the other side of the car was three lights. It was red, blue, and green. But when you turn them all on at the same time and you stand at a distance, it's white because they, all, they had them all focused towards the center and the three lights become one color, white. The, um, uh, the mixture of the colors, therefore, together, we refer to as white light because it's the, the absence of uh, the visible light spectrum of the wavelengths, we, we see it bounce off of objects and therefore we know what, what color those objects are. Uh, everything in a dark room appears black because there is no visible light to strike your eye as you gaze on it. So all you see is the darkness. So there's a separation. Light is divided uh, by color and is there is the seen and there is the unseen. There's uh, infrared, ultraviolet, x-rays, gamma rays um, that we can't see, but they're there. It's all these divisions in light that God says in the very beginning. And God divided the light, and he's divided that from the darkness. And one end of the spectrum is the infrared light, uh, which while um, humans actually emit this. Here's again where... Scientists that, you know, say, well, I'm an evol evolutionist, but they apply science to figure something out. If we emit red light, and we all do, everybody does, then you ought to be able to find it. That's why infrared cameras are helpful for thermal imaging, why they can use it to find people inside of a building. On the other hand, the spectrum, another end of, uh, side of the spectrum is the X-ray light, uh, which is actually too blue for our human eyes to see. Uh, another common light source that uh, have us encountered at the doctor's office, of course, is just general X-ray, which penetrate the skin and muscles uh, and allow to show the bones because it bounces off of that. Um, in the atmosphere... Uh, may or may not block the x-rays depending on what's happening, but I bring this up for a reason. Non-visible light can also be found in your house. And you use a device that uh, probably every day called a remote control. And your remote control is infrared light that's transmitted uh, signals to the television through electronics. While the signal is visible to you, the telev your television can process the light and respond. So you can't see it, but your television responds to it. Here's the point. The evolutions will say, I can't see God. Therefore, he doesn't exist. And yet every science, laws of science, dictate things that are invisible, but provable. <laughs> and so based upon that science, they set out to use things that we can't see, put it in a remote that the TV can see and receive. They did it by faith, and it's predictable. It works. The TV, therefore, if you will, has faith. <laughs> because it is faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen.
<laughs> the point of all that elaborate uh, going through of uh, some of the, the formulas and the dividing of light and everything else is to say we would understand none of that without biblical premise of absolute laws that God has established, that the Bible confirms. Scientists use all those laws for the purpose of knowing what happened in the past, what happens today, what will therefore happen in the future, what is predictable even with things that we haven't yet discovered. In other words, we know it's there, we just don't know how to divide it, like uh, how to get hydrogen out of oxygen for energy. They're just starting to figure that out, but it's there. It's predictable, even though you can't see the atoms. It's predictable. You bombard them, you can blow them up. Separate them, but you can't destroy them. <laughs> All of that is done by faith. But evolution says just the opposite in the non-science of it, the theory of it, that a rock exploded and everything in order developed from that. And predictable science ended up from chaos. No. It only happens by a creator who's ordained it to be so. Now, going from there to the most phenomenal creation of all, and that is mankind. We have the seeds, we have the sowing of the seeds, the result of the sowing of the seeds, and then verse 26, he says, then God said, let us make man, the us being uh, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, let us make man in our image according to our likeness, let them have dominion, which is what the devil lost. Let him have dominion um, over the fish of the, the sea, over the birds of the air, and over the cattle, and over the, all the earth, and every creeping thing that creeps on the earth. So God created man in his own image. In the image of God, he created him male and female. He created them. So he calls them Adam, or we use the term mankind in translation, but it they were both called Adam. Now, um, in Genesis, he creates Adam, Adam and Eve, and um, that's the first of mankind. Jesus is called, in 1 Corinthians 15, 45, the last Adam. Not the second Adam, the last Adam. Adam was created, therefore, in 1 Corinthians 15, 45, as a living soul. Jesus was a quickening spirit. In other words, giving life to our bodies. A quickening spirit. 1 Corinthians 15, 45. Now, we were made in the image of God. We are mankind in God's image. Jesus, for us to understand what's happening here, is God in the image of man. He is God in physical form. God becoming flesh and dwelling among us. Mankind is, in spirit, is a spiritual image of God in our flesh. In other words, when his spirit dwells in us, we are the image of God spiritually. He is physically the image of God. He's God becoming flesh. We have the appearance or the image, the reflection of God by his spirit in our flesh. The point of the creation of God is to provide a meaning or the meaning for us to exist and to know him. That relationship of being the very image and the reflection of him. When you put a mirror up and you look, you see yourself. The image of God, what he's looking for in us, is himself. <laughs> and that's not going to happen after the fall without Jesus Christ. Because when they died, God's spirit left them. And it wasn't until that sacrifice of a lamb to clothe them when they realized that they had nothing, they were naked. And so they needed clothing. They tried to take care of it themselves. He said, no, it's not going to do it. 
death had entered into their life. And when he killed the lamb and he clothed them, he covered their sins to give them that image then of their life to reflect God. Cain did not reflect God. Abel did. And so it begins. Until finally, that one who is the Lamb of God, slain before the foundations of the world, would come, die for us, send his spirit to dwell within us, not on a year-by-year basis where they would be forgiven of their sins under the law of Moses, but now all of that fulfilled from the very beginning of the Lamb of God in Genesis, coming to this place where now, when you receive Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, he dwells within you. And when God looks at you, he sees the image of God. And when we live it out, when we serve, when we, when we are touched by the Spirit of God to do something that's outside of who we are, and we deny ourselves, take up a cross and follow him, it's like the haze is wiped off and he can see in that mirror. He can see himself. And it's pleasing. It's pleasing to him and it's pleasing to us. When we forgive when we don't want to, he sees the image of Jesus Christ. He sees the image of God. When we give, when we serve, when we go beyond all the parameters of how the world thinks and how it operates, and we serve, and we understand what God sees and how he functions, we are the image of God. But to do it, we have to deny ourselves, our flesh, take up his cross and follow him. And then we have fellowship with him, and he with us, and we are that image. Just as sure as Christ in the flesh was an image of God, of, of us to God and God to us by becoming flesh. And so we are, when we are filled with his spirit and doing his will, we have fellowship with him. And we are in his image. When the world sees us do that, they go, what's with you? Because they see something that's contrary to their flesh. It is the very image of God. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for your word. We thank you for your, your promises, your science that you've given us, your blessings, but that we are created above all other creations, the earth first, and then we, as human beings that you've created to know you. You've literally created us to be the image of God. That when we have faith, hope, love, when we show mercy, kindness, gentleness, meekness, temperance, we reflect the very image of God. We are in that time, in that moment, a reflection of you to the world around us, of how much you love them, how much you care, the sacrifices that you've made and the sacrifice at the cross. Lord, thank you for your multiplied blessings and for allowing us to know you. And we pray this morning for anyone who doesn't. If God is speaking to your heart right now to know him, just call out and say, God Almighty, forgive me for my sins. I've violated your laws, I've your purpose and your plan, and my own conscience, forgive me. Come into my life right now and save my soul. Speak life into my being. Redeem me now by the blood of the Lamb. And thank you for eternal life because you rose from the dead, I'll rise too. Thank you, Jesus. Amen. Let's stand. Well, I pray that if you don't, if you've
prayed that prayer and give your life to Christ this morning. There's new believers packages here at the front and out in the foyer. You're welcome to get one. And uh, if you have any questions, ask any of the elders or myself. I'll be glad to pray with you. Uh, but the main thing that's going to happen, you know the Lord, uh, is the Word of God will open up to you as, a, as never before. And you'll be given the opportunity, uh, just as life goes on, to confess your faith, even baptism, but other ways. And uh, we encourage you to do that, to really take those steps of faith as you see yourself changing. You see yourself opening up and understanding things that you didn't before. And may the Lord bless you, keep you, make his face to shine upon you, lift up his countenance upon you, and give you peace. I pray for each one of us as we serve the Lord, as we read his scriptures. The whole point of doing a little background to Genesis is that because it's bombarded so often in the media, maligned, humorized, and everything else. I felt like we needed to just step back and look at it from God's vantage point in generality, in the sense of saying, look at, this is God's word. It is absolute, it is final, it is the final authority, and if I can trust it in Genesis, I can trust it the rest of the way through for my life. And if we can't trust it there, then we can't trust it anywhere. And so just... Uh, to, to realize the magnitude of how important this beginning is. And then we'll look at a little bit more about Adam and Eve and what happened to them and, and the very same things that happened with us. So I pray for God's wisdom and encouragement and direction and know that the prince and the power of the air that, that still has authority over this earth is a fallen prince. He's a judged prince. Uh, he is condemned. You are not. You have authority over him and everything else, and you need to exercise that authority in the name of Jesus Christ because he's given it to you, because God has given it to you. You didn't earn it. You didn't deserve it. It is a gift from God. This planet, your life, your future, your destiny is in your hands because he's given it to you to respond to him and be his image. God bless you.